Well, good morning, and thanks for joining us this Sunday at New City Church. Earlier in uh, last year, early 2021, um, I started watching some YouTube videos uh, about woodworking. I've never made anything in my life, but my four-year-old son really loves running around with tools. And long story short, I felt bad that I'd never be able to teach him anything. And so we watched these videos and we made uh, this, this birdhouse together. And I was like, this is actually really fun. So I started watching all these, these other videos and how to do woodworking and stuff. And it was kind of confusing. And these beginner videos weren't really beginner videos. But finally, I came across this guy who has this online course with all these angles and tells you exactly what to do. It's very easy. And he has a list of tools that he recommends you buy because you find out pretty quickly that it's kind of an expensive initial investment. And so I was like, hey, I'm going to do this thing. And so it cost about $1,000 to get everything to get started. So I used some money, uh, used some of our STEMI money. You know, we saved some of it. And then Christina had and I had some that we could spend. And so I spent about $1,000 to get all the equipment to begin woodworking. Now, the question is, is that a good investment or is that a waste of money? Is that extravagant spending or is it worth it? And how do you decide? How do you know whether or not that was a good idea? Or earlier this year, I, again, I have a grill. Don't grill that often. I was always really self-conscious when people come over because I'm like, I'm not sure if this is done, but we'll see. Hadn't killed anybody yet. But after talking to a few friends um, who had something called a Blackstone, which is a flat top griddle, they're like, this is amazing. I decided, well, if I learned how to make things, surely I can learn how to grill things. Uh, and so I bought it at uh, $600 total for the grill. You also need like an outdoor prep cart because on the flat top, uh, things, you, you make things really quickly. So you have to have everything ready, all the ingredients so that you can do it all at once. And so all in, granted, I sold the grill that I had, but all that stuff it, I'll considered, it cost me about $600. And my question to you is, again, was that wasteful? Was that extravagant? Was it a good deal? And how do you know? How do you know? And I ask those questions because today, as we continue through the gospel of Mark, we're going to read what might be a familiar passage to some of you, and we're going to be challenged with this same question for, with Jesus. And so the question that lays before us today as we get into this morning is this, how much is Jesus worth to you? How much? And how do you know if whatever your designation is, is actually accurate? Now, I know if you grew up in church or follow Jesus, maybe intellectually the answer is supposed to be, he's worth everything, he's worth my whole life, and okay, but like practically, how does that play itself out in your day-to-day -day life? And how do you know what you've kind of made Jesus, the, the value you've given your life to Jesus? How do you know that that's accurate? Is it too much? Is it too little? How do you know? And that's the question we're looking at this morning. And so if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and open up to Mark chapter 14. If not, there's a black one around you. The page number is on the screen. And if you do not own a Bible, you can take one of those home with you. So we're in Mark chapter 14. If you want to put the Mark slide on the screen, uh, page 902, and we'll get into it. Uh, some really quick uh, background information. We are going through the Gospel of Mark. We are getting very close to the end. Uh, there's only 16 chapters, so we're getting there. Uh, we are in Passion Week, and so one-third of Mark's Gospel about the life of Jesus is about about his last week of life. And so the last couple of weeks, we were in Mark 13, which was kind of confusing. Also interesting, where Jesus is talking about the destruction of the temple and also the end of the world. And now we're coming across, uh, we're going to be on Wednesday. Jesus is going to be uh, handed over really late Thursday night or really early Friday morning, however you want to decide that. But it's about two days before his betrayal and his crucifixion. And Mark has really one more story he wants to share with us before we get to Jesus's final moments. And here's what it says, Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 1, it says this. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a cunning way to arrest Jesus and kill him. Not during the festival, they said, so there won't be a riot among the people. So again, this is likely Wednesday, and there is urgency to get this done, right? Jesus has caused some problems in the temple earlier in the week. If you've been with us, we read about that. Uh, they know that he's gained quite the following. They don't like him, and so they're trying to figure out how do we arrest him and take care of him before Passover? How do we also do it in a way that there's not a big riot because he's gotten really popular? Um, it's also worth noting that a Passover happened in Jerusalem where the temple was. It was a week-long celebration, and Jerusalem would between double and triple in size when Passover happened, and it was the celebration of God rescuing the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, 
And some people associated or believed that during the Passover, the Messiah, whoever the Messiah was, whenever he shows up, he was going to use the Passover when all these people are in Jerusalem to kind of really start his revolution. And so they've been really concerned about Jesus. And some of them are likely thinking this Passover, he's in Jerusalem. He is going to use this time to kind of gather the people to start following him to do what he's going to do. But of course, they have a problem with him. Now, none of us, of course, lived in the first century, traveled to Jerusalem, so we don't really know what the Passover is like. And so to get it into your mind, maybe the closest analogy I could think of is think of the state fair in Raleigh, North Carolina. Many of you have been there. If you haven't, you just need to go once, okay? Happens in October. And what happens? The state fairgrounds are an explosion of people. For 10 days, there is way more people in this confined space than there is the rest of the year. You have a lot of food. You have a lot of people. You even also have animals. You have games for kids and carnival games. Not necessarily there were carnival games during Passover, but certainly there would have been things for kids to do. You have, a, you have crowds of people, and you have lots of smells, some good, not some not so much. So think of the State Fair at North Carolina for a week, plus camping, okay? So no one's going home to take a shower. There is no AC, okay? And so this is just, it's a big, smelly, happy party for a week, and that's what Passover is kind of like. Now, again, the leaders have been thinking of a way to arrest Jesus. And as we have seen, they are also afraid of an uprising. And so time is getting short uh, and, and they can't do this in front of the crowds. So, like we've got to make this happen. Now, before we continue, I want to make one other note. Uh, the, the gospel writers do not always write things chronologically. So the story we're going to read this morning that Mark is going to tell us about Jesus um, actually doesn't happen on Wednesday. Now, we know this, and I, I would say this is not a sleight of hand tactic. It's actually pretty obvious when the gospel writers move things around. Um, they do this, however, to make a point. If you've been with us, even through the gospel of Mark, you actually see how brilliant the biblical writers are. Even if you're not a follower of Jesus, they're actually quite brilliant. And so they're not trying to trick you or to do anything, but sometimes they move things around because they want to show us something. And so we know that this actually happened in John chapter 12. The same story we're about to read is written in John chapter 12. And John tells us that this story actually happens six days before Passover. So really in the beginning, right when Jesus and his disciples entered Jerusalem is when this story happened. Um, and so Mark, however, is putting this story after verses one and two and before verse 10 to show us something which we're going to see. And so this happens six days before Passover when his disciples and Jesus originally get to the Jerusalem area or the area of Jerusalem. And here's the story. It says this in verse 3. While he was in Bethany, this is where they stayed in Jerusalem, or while they were in Jerusalem, the week of the Passion Week, his last week of life. It's about two miles outside of Jerusalem. While he was in Bethany, at the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at the table, a woman came in with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured it on his head. Now, we don't know who Simon the leper is or was. It's very likely that Mark's original audience knew who he was. Uh, he also doesn't, doesn't have leprosy anymore because they wouldn't be celebrating you know, a whole group of people, a meal together in someone's house who was a leper. But even if you are healed from leprosy or if you have recovered, you, that, kind of, that name or that, uh, that, that kind of, well, that you had leprosy stays with you for the rest of your life. Now, again, we don't know Simon's story. There's a good possibility that Jesus is actually the, the one that heals him. But nonetheless, they are at his house. And then you have this unnamed woman who intrudes on the gathering. So typically in first century ancient culture, the men and women most oftentimes would be in separate rooms doing separate things. Uh, every once in a while, a woman might come in, the, in a gathering of men to maybe serve food or to help with something. But they're at separate places. And an unnamed woman comes in with Jesus and the men that he is with. And then she anoints him with extremely expensive perfume. Now, we'll see this in a few verses. They estimate, the people that are in this room, estimate that it was about 300, it was worth 300 denarii, which a denarii is one day's wage, which I know still is kind of confusing, but maybe for your context, just think whatever you make for a year, uh, that is how much this perfume costs. So it's really expensive. And on top of that, as a woman... Now, she likely does not have a job where she can afford something like this. So not only is this very expensive, but this is probably an, a family heirloom or something equivalent to that. So not only is there a lot of monetary value, but there's got to be a ton of sentimental value as well. And so that's what's happening here. And she breaks the flask. And then so therefore she has to use all of it. She has to use all of it. It's really expensive, not just monetarily, but probably personally, but she uses it. For Jesus. 
Now, as an aside really quick, in this story, Mark mentions the town, which is Bethany. He mentions the house, Simon the leper. He doesn't mention the name of the woman. However, in John's gospel, John tells us it's Mary Magdalene, which is the sister of Martha. If you're familiar with the story of Lazarus and Mary and Martha, this is who it is. Um, But Mark, again, the reason why he does this is he's trying to show us that faithfulness doesn't come from where you expect. This story does not happen in Jerusalem. It's happening in a former leper's house uh, by an unnamed woman. This is pretty much as like excommunicated as you can get. And yet she does something extraordinary. She does something extraordinary. And then here's the reaction from some of the people in the room who see this. Verse 4, he goes, it continues, Mark says this. But some were expressing indignation to one another. Why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they began to scold her. Now, again, it's, it's hard to maybe totally calculate this. We know in Mark chapter 6, during the feeding of the 5,000, before Jesus feeds the 5,000, he tells his disciples to go get some food. And they said it would cost over 200 denarii to feed a, to feed a group of over 5,000 people. And so this is, you know, they're trying to think of all the people you could feed, all the poor people you could help. Why is she doing this? And so they condemn her for her waste. Now, again, Mark doesn't tell us because Mark's pretty quick in all of his accounts. But John's gospel tells us the one who is leading this rebuke is actually Judas, one of Jesus's 12 disciples. Now, we also know that John tells us that Judas was in charge of the money bag. So he was essentially the the treasurer for the disciples on their journey. And he would steal from it. So he would steal from Jesus and the disciples and take it for himself. And he is the one who is now mad at her for being generous towards Jesus because under the guise of we could have given this to other people, he's likely thinking, you could have sold this and I could have taken it, some of it for myself. It's interesting, one of the things that I have noticed that pretty much all of the really generous people I know never uh, talk about other people's generosity. Uh, they, never, they never condemn or never, they're always just focused on what they can do. And yet J- Judas here, who we know is the opposite of generous, is under the pretext of piousness and good person and generosity, is condemning this woman for what she is doing. Now, here's what's interesting. And one of the things that I kind of came across as I was studying this text, because maybe for some of you, this text was also familiar for me. Uh, One of the things that's interesting here is that they not only rebuke the woman for her extravagant gift, which is normal, but one of the realizations I had as I was studying to preach this was if they're rebuking this woman, then the opposite is also true. If they are saying that Jesus, that what she's doing is wasteful, then by association or on the flip side, here's what they're also saying, that Jesus isn't worth this extravagance. That's expensive. He's not worth it. Therefore, it's wasteful, right? Because if he was worth it, then therefore there would be no problem. It's kind of one of those things where everything needs to be done in moderation. Maybe if we were putting modern language on it. What's interesting, when you hear things like everything in moderation, it doesn't seem to apply to sex, power, authority, or money. Our culture kind of says, go for it and get it. Do whatever makes you happy. But when it comes to matters of faith and religion, it's like, well, be careful. Don't do too much. Just do everything in moderation. And so again, therefore, the question that leads us that we must ask ourselves as we read this text is how much is too much devotion to Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me, how much? And how do we actually know? Like you might be thinking, some perfume, per- perfume sure, he's, a, he's really respected, he's been gathering a lot of crowds, we really, really like this guy, so maybe he's worth some of it, but all of it's when it's that expensive. And then the question is, and also who decides this? Like how do we actually know how much is too much? According to who? Who's telling us what is actually the right amount? You know what this, what this makes me think of, of trying to decide like who's right, who's wrong, is it worth it, is it not? Uh, is I, like when it comes to TV shows and movies, I'm a one and done guy. Like I don't watch things more than once because once you see it, like yeah, I might have picked up on things that I missed, but like I know the story, I know how it ends, it is not intriguing to me. And so I am always, always fascinated when a new movie comes out that's like a trilogy or there's like a series of them, people say, I had to watch all the old movies to get caught up. And I'm like, why? 
There's a thing called YouTube that gives you a five-minute recap. Or even worse, when there's a new show that comes out, a new season, right? And there's like five or six seasons in, and it comes out. And they're like, I watch all seasons to get ready for this. And I'm like, what a waste. I don't say this because obviously, but like in my mind, I'm like, what a waste of time. Like, why would you do that? You watched all of these episodes or people that can quote like every line from a movie. I'm like, how many times did you watch this movie for you to be able to do this? And who, like, and why would you want to do it? Like, it's not interesting. There's no tension. Like, you know exactly to me. I'm like, it makes no sense. That's a waste. However, I'm a big sports guy. And so I could tell you people's jerseys numbers. I could tell you someone's batting average from 1999. I could tell you where they went to school, how tall they are, how much they weigh, their career stats. And like, some people are like, why? Like you watch, okay, come on. Like that's just, okay. Um, They're like, well, tell me more. That's what they think. No, but it's like, you watch these same guys play with this same ball every year. Nothing different happens. And then you watch the post-game interviews about people talking about what you just watched. And you watch like, like, why? It's a big waste of time, right? So the question is, who decides that? Like, who decides this is worth your time or this isn't, right? And when it comes to Jesus, the question is the same. Who decides who, what is too much or what is not enough? And how do you know if you are right? right? How do some of these men who are condemning this woman know whether she is right or she is wrong in what she is doing? How much is too much? Devotion to Jesus. And how do we know? That's what's happening here. That's the question that Mark is inviting us to consider. And so here's how Jesus responds. Mark chapter 14, verse 6. He then says this. After they condemn her, they scold her. He says, Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a noble thing for me. You always have the poor with you, and you can do what is good for them whenever you want, but you do not always have me. And so in Jesus' response here, he does not get into it with them about charitable giving, about how much they should give and all these sorts of things. His concern in this story is with her treatment and the good that she has actually done. Now, as a quick side note, this should not be taken as Jesus uh, downplaying helping those in need against generosity or against charitable giving. Because remember, a massive reason as to why he is, he's being wanting to be convicted and killed and imprisoned and all these things is precisely for his treatment and care of outsiders for his care and treatment for people who are less than, for his care and treatment of the people that society says do not matter. So he certainly cares about these things, but his priority is always the people in front of him, and he sees an opportunity to teach these people something that they are missing. And so here, Jesus, rather, is focusing on the woman herself and her mistreatment from these other men, right? That he's saying that those condemning her, they can help them if they really care, They can help the poor whenever they want. And instead of getting mad what someone else could do, they should just, out of their own pockets and out of their own generosity, they should actually do it. But right now, this woman has the opportunity to express devotion to me, and there's not, and I'm not always going to be here for you guys to do that. And on top of that, this woman seems to be the only one who actually sees how valuable Jesus is is. She's the only one that actually seems to see this, right? Her gift to Jesus is only okay. It's only extravagant if he's not worthy of it. But what if he is? But what if he is, right? And this is what I think Mark is showing us here, that our contentment, or sorry, our commitment to Jesus can only be extravagant if he is not worthy of it. Our commitment to Jesus can only be extravagant. It can only be wasteful. It can only be over the top if he's not actually worthy of it, right? So like, for example, if I were to spend (coughs) thousands and thousands of dollars on photography equipment, even though I don't care about photography, I'm not a photographer, I'd have no desire to be one, my iPhone is good enough for me, um, that would probably be a waste. Like, it wouldn't be worth doing these things if I wasn't actually going to use it. Like, I think that's a pretty cut and dry example of like, that's extravagant. That's not worth it. You don't care. You're not good at it. Don't do it. 
Or like, <laughs> there are many times where like, if you fly, if you ever fl- flown, where like you, you walk in the, the airplane, right, and you, and you walk past, uh, past business class. And there are many, many times where I've thought to myself, what a waste. Like, it's like a couple hours, and it's like a couple hundred dollars, maybe a thousand dollars extra for you to sit here. Like, to me, in my mind, I'm like, I can't comprehend why anybody would, that seems extravagant. And I was having a conversation with someone about this recently, and they were saying, did you know that there are many times where business class costs almost the same or like $20 more based on flights and stuff like that happens, which is, I didn't know that. Or of course, there are times where maybe your business is flying you. And so like, why would you say no? Or maybe you're a frequent flyer, and so they bump you up for free. Uh, or maybe, like, let's say you're flying across the country and you have a big presentation. Maybe you lead a nonprofit or for your business and you have someone who's going to invest, right? You probably need to be well rested for what you're going to do. And so, whatever that plane ticket costs, it's probably worth it for what you are actually trying to do, right? There are times where it could be wasteful, but there are times that it could absolutely be worth it depending on the context and preferences and how much money maybe somebody has to do these things. And when it comes to Jesus, this is where we find ourselves, right? Jesus certainly can be a waste to follow, or he could be worth it all, depending on who he is, right? He can be a waste. It can be worth it. It can be throwing your life away, life away, or it can be worth it if he is who he claims to be. It is all dependent on whether he is the son of God, the God, the king of kings who has come to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. If he's actually that person, well, then it might be worth it. If it's not, it might be a waste. And as a side note, what's also interesting here (laughs) is that Messiah literally means anointed one. That's what it literally means. And so here in this story, you have a woman, and I don't know that this is not a word, but I'm going to use it anyway, like Messiahing Jesus. Like she's literally anointing him. Like she's anointing the anointed one, and everyone's like, what a waste. Why would you do that? Right? Our commitment to Jesus, this woman's commitment to Jesus, can only be extravagant if he's not worthy of it. And so here's how it says again. We'll pick it up in verse 7. Again, Jesus says this. You always have the poor with you, and you can do what is good for them whenever you want. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body in advance for burial. Truly, I tell you, whenever, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. What she has done will also be told in memory of her. And so what does Jesus say about this woman in response to what she has done? Right? In verse 8, it says, she has done what she could. Now, here's what's interesting. This is the exact same commendation that Jesus gives to the poor widow in Mark chapter 12, where we read about a few weeks ago, if you were here, where essentially this woman goes to the temple and gives like two pennies. I mean, she gives nothing. Like it would cost more in time to count what she gave than for what she actually gave. And in this setting, Jesus says this woman was more faithful than everyone else even though she gave a fraction of what everyone else gave because she was a poor widow and she gave out of, abundant, out of her abundance. She gave out of everything that she has, whereas everyone else was just giving, giving out of their leftovers. So in Mark 12, you have a woman who does not have much giving it all. And then in Mark 14, you have a woman who has something that's very expensive also giving it all. And so in Mark 12 and Mark 14, you have two no-named women are doing what even the disciples aren't doing or fully understanding in the moment or up until this point. And one of the things we need to understand as we read the Gospels, as we think about following Jesus, and as we think about what other people might be doing in their relationships to Jesus, is that we need to understand that faithfulness to Jesus is not a comparison game, right? Faithfulness to Jesus is simply doing what you are able to do. That's what this woman does in Mark 14. That's what the poor widow does in Mark 12. Uh, And she is, again, also helping prepare him for his death that everyone else hasn't fully understood up until this point. But they are only doing what they can do. And it reminds me really quick of what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11. It'll be on the screen. It's one of his well-known teachings. You've probably heard it before if you've been around church or grew up in the church. And here's what Jesus says about following him. He says, come to me. All you who are weak, or sorry, all are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. 
Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, real quick, in case you're not familiar with some of these concepts, a yoke was a wooden frame that would join two animals or more together to pull things. Um, And they would pull heavy loads, and it was also a metaphor of a person's subjugation or they're following someone else, following rules or restrictions of someone else. And so uh, a yoke was often used as a common Jewish metaphor or idiom for the law, for the Old Testament law. It was referred to as a yoke of things that you must do in order to honor God. And so Jesus, again, is talking about a yoke, which is pretty normal for a religious leader. And yet he says about his yoke, which you would not expect a religious leader to say. He says that his yoke is actually easy and light. Now, the question is how? Because if you're a follower of Jesus, you know that following Jesus can be hard, right? Doing what he's asked you to do, being generous, forgiving people, putting other people first, that's hard. So how can he say it's easy and light? Well, two reasons real quick. One is because he redeems us. It is not based on our effort. So our salvation, our forgiveness, God's grace towards us is not based on what we do, but based on what he does. And so what we do is in response to what he has done, but it's not to get something from him. And so he redeems us. So his yoke is easy because it's not on us. And secondly, he only ever asks us to do what we can do. He never asks us to do what someone else can do. And so you might think, well, I don't have a lot of money, I don't have a lot of social media followers, I don't have a lot of influence, I don't have a lot of authority on all these things, so I can't do what other, these, these other people are doing. But Jesus never asks you to do that. Or put another way, faithfulness to Jesus is simply doing what you can do. Faithfulness to Jesus is simply doing what you can do. The greatest commandment that Mark's gospel also talks about, what does Jesus say? That we are to love God and love others. So the best question we can ask ourselves is, how can I love somebody today? Or how can I love someone else this week? And that's it, right? It's not how can I, compare to other people, do things that might be significant or better than or less than. What Jesus is inviting me into is simply, what is he asking me to do? Or what is he inviting me to do this week? And regardless of whether it looks like a lot or looks like uh, not, not a lot to other people, that is irrelevant to Jesus, He's only asking us to do what he simply, what we can do, not what someone else can do. And so if you're a follower of Jesus here this morning and you're struggling, maybe you feel guilty, like I don't do all these things compared to these people, Jesus has never compared you to that. He's simply saying faithfulness to me is simply doing what you can do. And that is what this woman is doing in this passage. In the last couple of verses, we'll read Mark chapter 10. Then Mark picks up the story. Uh, this is likely picking up back on Wednesday to focus this point. He then says this. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. And when they heard this, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he started looking for a good opportunity to betray him. So Mark 14 begins saying, we've got to get rid of Jesus. Then you have a story of this woman being faithful to Jesus. And Judas, as we see in John chapter 12, is mad at her for her lack of generosity. And then Wednesday comes, things are getting tight, and now he is going to take money to betray and to give up Jesus. Now, the question we all have, of course, is why would Judas do this? Of course, the answer is we don't know. Maybe he was overtaken by his continual desire for greed or for more. Uh, maybe he was frustrated with Jesus because this idea that, you know, he's done all these things, this talk about this Messiah, his kingdom... But yet he's not doing what Judas or what many people thought. He's not taking Rome by force. He's not gathering an army. And so perhaps Judas became disillusioned or upset with Jesus. We do not know. All that we know is that Jesus was betrayed by one of the closest people to him. And this, and this story uh, is being sandwiched between the reminder, again, of, the, of this woman's generosity, that Passover is almost here, and the leaders want Jesus, Jesus dealt with, and Judas' agreement to hand him over, again, we get a story, one last story, to show us what faithfulness actually looks like. And we have to wonder, as we read it, does this woman do too much? Does she do too much? That's what we can see on the surface as we read this. But I think the better question in this scene is this. Is Jesus worth it? Is he worth it? Or again, for us this morning, the question is this, is Jesus worth giving your life to? Is he worth it? 
Because this woman essentially is giving her life. She's giving her savings. She's giving her security. She's giving all she has to Jesus. Is it worth it? Is he worth it? (laughs) Now, Jesus, of course, what does he say? He says that this woman's memory or what she has done will be told in memory of her when the gospel, when the good news of Jesus is shared. The question is why? Well, I think the answer is because when everybody else missed it, she rightly saw what Jesus was worth. Because what we see Jesus going to soon do, he was going to do something that if you really think about it in the context of what Jesus has done and who he is, is also extremely excessive. In fact, in Mark 14, later on, we'll see soon that it literally uses the same words to describe what Jesus does on the cross. It says that he poured out his blood for us. He broke the flask and gave everything to us. And again, if, you, if you're familiar with church, been around this, this, we kind of can maybe get numb to this, this idea, but it's actually crazy. That God, the king of the universe, and I don't know what the telescope is called, whatever, recently that took like the biggest picture ever, and you see all these galaxies and all these stars, the God who is over all these things has this tiny planet called Earth where he has these human beings that he loves, who rejected him, who killed him, and he has come to offer us grace and forgiveness before you even have to do anything to earn it, before you have to promise anything, before you have to show your worth to Jesus, God says, I have come to give my life for you. And in the context of who God is compared to who we are, should we not ask the question, is that not wasteful? Is it not wasteful for Jesus, for God to come in the form of a man named Jesus and pour out his life for us, for Jesus, who has always been in perfect communion with the Father to experience hell on our behalf, even though we have done nothing to deserve it. Is that not wasteful? The question is, why would Jesus give everything for us? And here's my, the answer to the best of my ability. I have no idea. I have like, it makes no sense to me. All I can do is learn and read what scripture tells us that God does this because he loves us. He came because he loves you. And so here's what you need to know this morning, whether you're a follower of Jesus here today or not, that you are not a waste to God. You're not a waste. These disciples and these men could have completely missed who Jesus was in the moment and think that this woman is wasting and she's being way extravagant. Why would she do this? And yet this is exactly what Jesus does for us. He pours out everything simply out of his love, not because he needs us, not because we can offer him something that he can't have himself, but simply out of his love for us. And so again, is it worth, again, giving your allegiance in your life to the one who has made it possible for you to experience true life and true freedom? I think that's the question. (laughs) Or as we started here this morning, we asked this question, how much is Jesus worth to you? How much is he worth to you? Well, I think if we reflect on what Christ has done for us, I think here's an answer that I probably would say, that nothing we can give to Jesus can be greater than what he has given to us. How much is he worth? Well, however you answer that question, whatever you might try to do or think you're supposed to do, there is absolutely nothing you can do or I can do that could ever come close to what he has done for us. Nothing we can give to Jesus is greater than what he has given us. It's us. Nothing. And so, if we think back to what I shared in the beginning, when I asked the question, is $1,000 wasteful or extravagant? Is it worth actually spending all that money to start a new hobby? Well, let me just, and I'm projecting here a little bit, as I try to answer this question, what what if this is true? What if that $1,000 turns into a lifelong favorite hobby that I no longer have to spend money on because I make stuff, I sell it online, and so it all covers the cost, so I don't have to spend any money on it anymore, that also provides a connection with my son that would not have had otherwise as we grow up and as we make things together. And because men typically need a third object to actually talk and connect, that, that because of this woodworking, right, he is comfortable having conversations with me about God, about girls, about life, about questions that he might have. And so we have these conversations and then we have these memories that I will take with me for the rest of my life that I never would have had otherwise. Is $1,000 worth it? Well, I think a lot of you, if you're a parent, you would say there is no amount of money that, that you could pay. That would be, that, 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 like you would pay anything to have these things, these memories, these conversations with your kids. 
I think context changes everything. Or is $600 too extravagant for a grill set if you can afford it? Maybe. However, since I got this grill, I have been cooking dinner three to four times a week. And so if you were to ask Christina, she probably would say, you can add a couple zeros to this thing and it is still worth it to me because I need a break, right? In context, it actually might be worth it. And listen, is Jesus worth giving our life to? Well, when you think about what he has done, what he has given us in Christ, the good news of the gospel, that it's not about what you have done, your efforts, your trying hard, but God who came in the form of the man to live the perfect life that you could not live, that I could not live, to die the death that I should have died, that you should have died, to experience hell, to experience separation from God that we deserved on our behalf. This is what he has done for us. And there is nothing we could do to repay him. There is nothing. And so I think, again, the quick question here, practically speaking, is what would it look like for you in response to this uh, to do what you can in response to what he has done for you? Not out of obligation, not to try to pay him back somehow, but simply knowing what God has done for me, what would it look like for me to live in a way simply just to respond to him? Right? For some of you, maybe it's repentance and faith. You've been coming for a while. Maybe you're watching online and, and you're not quite sure about this Jesus thing. Repentance and faith. Repentance, the best way, my favorite way to describe repentance is simply being honest. That you're broken, that you've blown it, that you've got guilt and you've got regret and Jesus wants to take it from you. That all you have to do is be honest about your shame. Be honest about your brokenness. And Jesus says, let me forgive you. Let me love you right where you are in the midst of your doubts, in the midst of your sin, in the midst of you not understanding the Bible or really not understanding how to follow me. I don't want to turn on any of that right now. I just want you to love, know that I love you and that I care. Maybe for some of us, our response is just repentance and faith. Maybe for some of us, it's being more generous, maybe with our time, maybe with our finances or just how we live. How do we love people well in response to how God has loved us so that other people can experience his love as well? Or maybe for some of us, it's actually committing to a local church where we can live on mission together. And so if you're new with us, again, we have our Discover Lunch happening right after service today. Even if it's your first time here, it's going to be about an hour long right here. We're just going to explain what New City is, our mission, our value, so that you can know if this is the church that God might be wanting you to take part and mission with together. So I would encourage you to stick around, right? Maybe committing to a local church and stepping into the game and not sitting on the sidelines is what God is inviting you in to do. Or maybe here's just a really, I think, practical prayer as we think about living our life in response to what Christ has done. Maybe you could pray this this week. What can I give this week in response to what you have given me? Right? If there's nothing I can do that will ever be close to what you have done for me, God, would you just reveal for me today and this week, what can I do simply in response? Who can I love? Who can I pray for? Who can I care for? Because there is nothing we can give to Jesus that can be greater than what he has given to us. He is worth it all, and he is inviting us in to experience his grace. Hey, thanks so much for checking out this video. We upload new videos every week to help encourage you in your faith in Jesus. So be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you'd never miss a thing.